UFC 300 betting and DraftKings show. We have 13 fights on Saturday, the most stacked pay-per-view in UFC history. $200,000 to first place on DraftKings. I'm John Kelly. Let's hear the picks. And we're going to kick things off in the bantamweight division as Davis and Figueredo is a minus 310 favorite. The comeback on Cody Garbrandt is plus 250. And we'll start on the Figueredo side. He made his bantamweight debut against Rob Font in December. And clearly his power is going to be able to translate to 135, no problem. He was known as one of the biggest hitters at 125. And it seemed like he just carried a lot more pop in his punches than Font did. And we also saw him land multiple takedowns against Font as well. So he largely dominated that fight 30-27 on multiple scorecards, whereas when Cody Garbrandt fought Rob Font, it was basically non-competitive, and that was just two years ago. I think we could see a lot of value boys kind of chase the big price tag on the Garbrandt side, but I think it's a donation this week, boys. I don't think Cody Garbrandt is even close to the fighter that he used to be. And really, the, his fighting style has kind of changed over the years because back in the day when he was at his best, you know, he's trading in the pocket. He's going to war. He's got sharp leg kicks, good boxing, can wrestle when he needs to. Now that his chin is compromised, he's been knocked out four times in his career his styles basically change completely. He no longer wants to engage in those type of brawls inside the phone booth because he knows he's going to get hurt. So now he's kind of transformed himself into this low volume, stay on the outside for the most part. Like, I just don't think that's conducive to winning minutes. And when you're fighting somebody like Figueredo, who does have big power, who has a great guillotine choke if Cody does try to wrestle him, I just think Figgy's got multiple ways to win this fight. And I don't even think this version of Garbrandt is a good minute winner, even against a low-volume guy like Figueredo. So give me Figueredo. I think he gets the finish here. We're going Figgy by knockout. That's the official pick. And next fight up, we have Bobby King Green, a minus 180 favorite with the comeback on Jim A-10 Miller at plus 150. And this is a fight that was actually booked twice in the past, and it just wasn't able to go through. So they booked it a third time, and now Jim Miller's making UFC history as the only fighter to fight at UFC 100, UFC 200, and now he will fight at UFC 300 this weekend. The guy is an absolute tank, an absolute legend, and even at this stage in his career, even at 40 plus years old, like the dude is still a tough out. And anytime you give him a step down in competition, he's gonna take care of those fighters and, and typically finish them. Now, when he faces a step up, that's usually when you see the limitations, mainly due to the gas tank, because we know as fights extend, Miller's cardio does not look great. Typically in the back end of the second round is usually where we start to see a noticeable difference. But early on, I mean, he's got sharp leg kicks. His boxing, I think, has always been a little bit underrated by the market. And we know he's got that dangerous submission grappling, a ton of submissions on his record as well. And I just have concerns with Bobby Green here. Even though I think he's the better striker, I think he's got better cardio, and that's why I think he is the rightful favorite. But he's coming off an absolute brutal knockout against Jalen Turner. That was probably the worst stoppage I've ever seen in my life. And he's been knocked out multiple times now. He's been submitted in the past as well. I know his defensive grappling checks out, but this is a guy that I don't trust to lay juice on in this type of a matchup because he's coming off such a brutal knockout not that long ago. We've seen him finish in the past. We've seen the fight IQ concerns as well. And Miller's a guy that's going to be a dog in there. He's going to make this fight competitive while he has the cardio to do so. So it's going to be one where I slightly favor Green because I do think he has more decision equity. And I expect this fight to hit the judges' scorecards. But I think Miller's going to be competitive here. For that reason, I actually want more Miller on DraftKings because I think he has more finishing potential. And I just don't really like Bobby Green's upside, especially on a slate that's so stacked. He's basically the only fighter you know, above 8K that I, I really just don't have much interest in. I think basically all the other fighters have a bigger ceiling. So I'm going to side with Green by decision as the official pick. But in terms of DraftKings, I'm going to be leaning towards the underdog in Miller in terms of my exposure. And next fight up, we have Jessica Andrade, a minus 135 favorite with Marina Rodriguez on the comeback at plus 114. 
and I side with the Andrade side for a couple reasons here. For starters, I think you're getting the more explosive fighter, the one with more finishing upside on the feet. She's a very powerful striker, but I also am more interested in the grappling upside here because if we expect Andrade to go to the grappling, I think that's where the biggest advantage is in this fight because she's shown she's capable of landing multiple takedowns, and Marina Rodriguez has shown that anytime you're going to do that to her, she just doesn't really have an answer for it. She defends takedowns poorly. Once you get her down, you can certainly control her. She doesn't have a great get-up game. And I think that's just going to be the biggest difference here is you're getting the more explosive fighter on the feet and the one with the grappling upside. I think the concern with Andrade is that she is very hittable and she's always getting stung, it seems like. Like, she's like a bobblehead on the... Like, that's what she looks like when she's striking because she's getting hit, she's wobbled, whatever. But I still find it hard to believe that Rodriguez is going to finish her. And if she doesn't, I think... Andrade is just as likely to land those big shots on the feet. And then, like I mentioned, has all the grappling upside as well. So we're going to side with Andrade here. Andrade by decision is the official pick. And next fight up, we have a banger matchup with Jalen Turner, a minus 310 favorite. The comeback on Hanado Moicano is plus 250. And this one is pretty straightforward to me because I think if you expect it to play out on the feet, you have to favor Jalen Turner. This dude is very explosive, very long for the division, and we know he carries clear your knockout power. He, but on the flip side, Hanato Moicano, one of the better back takers on the UFC roster, he may only need one grappling exchange, and I would expect him to pursue the grappling path here. I just have concerns. You know, it seems like every time the fight's playing out at space, he's getting stung. He's getting hurt. And even in that last fight against Drew Dober, who's another very powerful striker, it was like, Man, he, he he landed some good shots on Dober too. Obviously had the grappling success, but Dober was stinging him left and right. And it basically just came down to one lateral drop mistake by Dr Dober there. And that's what cost him the fight here. I just don't think Turner, I, I just don't see that happening here. I think if Turner gets him hurt, he smells blood in the water. He's he's good enough defensively to keep the fight on the feet where he needs it. And I think he'll get a finish here. So it's one where I think you want exposure to both sides on DraftKings because they both have clear finishing ability. But I'm going to side with Jalen Turner here. I just don't trust the chin of Moicano to hold up. We're going Turner by TKO. That's the official pick. And I did want to mention, guys, FightNumbers.com. We're running a promo this week for UFC 300. We have an odd screen exclusive to UFC. It updates in real time for live betting as well. You can also filter it to display the best prices for money lines and totals. It pulls from over 100 sports books. We also have the Fight Prop Finder where you can search any fighter and you can display their prices for uh, props across the market. So it really just streamlines that line shopping experience for you guys. And of course, we have Evan, Ozzy, Pepe, Silvia, some of the best bettors in the MMA industry. Their picks are up behind the paywall as well. It's all included on the DFS side of the house. We have Fight Pick Sim, which is an exclusive optimization tool for DraftKings. You obviously get my DraftKings content as well. So be sure to check that out. I mentioned the promo is 300 at checkout for 10% off. I'll link it in the description below. Now back to the fight. Next fight up, we have Diego Lopez, a minus 135 favorite. The comeback on Sadiq Youssef currently is plus 114 and we'll start on the Lopez side he's coming off an electric first round knockout victory over Pat Sabatini and it's very clear that that's what he's capable of doing he's capable of hurting you early or submitting you early because he has a very dangerous guard one of the more dangerous grapplers in the division in my opinion but I still kind of feel that he's overperformed to this point, you know, he made the short notice debut against Evloev and gave him everything that he can handle. Quick finish over Pat Sabatini. Like, that's what he's capable of. But we just haven't really seen the downside of a guy like Diego Lopez. Somebody that I don't think is going to carry his power over 15 minutes. Somebody that I don't think is a very good technical striker. And if he doesn't have those big moments where he's hurting people or submitting people, then I think he's going to be dropping minutes. And I think that could happen here against somebody who's more experienced like Sadiq Youssef. This guy has fought five rounds. He's coming off the main event loss to Edson Barbosa. I think the biggest thing for me with, with Youssef is he has been hurt. He has been rocked multiple times, even in his last fight against Barbosa. So that's a concern when you're fighting somebody as explosive as Lopez is going to be early. 
But over 15 minutes, I do think Yusuf is clearly the better technical striker. I think he could piece him up with a jab. I don't think his grappling's bad either. So if they do tangle up a little bit, I'd expect Yusuf to stay safe, especially if he's in dominant position here. So I'm going to side with Yusuf just as the more experienced fighter, the better striker over 15 minutes. I think that's going to pay dividends here. We're going Yusuf by decision. That's going to be the official pick. But in terms of DraftKings, it's another one where even though I, I'm leaning towards Yusuf to win the fight, I think it's very clear that Lopez has more round one finishing upside. And if that's the case, that's always what I'm going to lean towards on DraftKings as a tournament player because I just want to try to capture that ceiling. So in terms of DraftKings, I'll likely have more on the Lopez side. Next fight up, we have the highly anticipated UFC debut of Kayla Harrison. She's a big favorite here at minus 425. The comeback on Holly Holm, another exciting fighter, is plus 330 currently. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on here. Obviously, I'm being a little bit sarcastic there. I think Holly Holm's one of the most boring fighters on the UFC roster. And now she's on the wrong side of 40, facing somebody that I think fights a similar type of style, but somebody that's better at it, in my opinion, in Kayla Harrison, who is just going to be bigger, stronger, younger, faster, quicker. I just think she's going to be able to beat home to a lot of these positions here, and I'd expect her to win. Now, in terms of DraftKings, Harrison's very expensive. She's the second most expensive fighter on the slate. I just don't know if she has that type of ceiling, especially when you factor in we have three five-round fights on this card. On top of that, we have other fights that have clear round one finishing upside. I'm just not sure if Harrison has that type of ceiling, especially at her price tag, in order to pay that off for the optimal lineup. So we're going to side with Harrison in terms of the win. We're going to go Harrison by decision. But in terms of DraftKings, this is probably my least favorite fight on the card to target. Next fight up, we have Aljamain Sterling making his featherweight debut. The former bantamweight champion is now moving up to the 145-pound division. He comes in as a sizable favorite at minus 162. The comeback on Calvin Cater is plus 162. 36. Now we'll start on the Sterling side. I mentioned the move up in weight class and I think a lot of people are just expecting him to just be as dominant as he was at 135. I just think I have a little bit more concerns than the market seems to at this price because Sterling, some of his best advantages at 135 was being longer than most people that he fought, being a lot stronger, more physical than those people where he was able to just kind of muscle his way into those advantageous grappling positions. We know he's one of the better back takers at 135, but his wrestling has never really been that great. And we know when the fight does play out at space here, he's now facing somebody that's even longer than he is, that somebody that's a clearly better striker than him. Cater, it wasn't long ago before people called him the best boxer in the UFC. I think he's one of the best boxers in the UFC. I think the concerns that we have with Cater is obviously coming off a blown ACL in that Arnold Allen fight. But I think that's why the price is where it's at because, I mean, without that injury here, I make Cater a favorite in this matchup. I don't understand. People just seem to expect that the takedowns are going to be automatic and the back tanks are going to be automatic because if you don't expect that, I don't see how you can make Sterling a favorite here because Cater, historically, very difficult to take down, very difficult to grapple. He fought Zabit, who only took him down once. He fought Dan Ige, who tried nine times, couldn't take him down once. And he fought Josh Emmett just two fights ago, who tried to take him down four times and he couldn't take him down once. So these are all guys that have legitimate wrestling skills and some of them are even better than Sterling in terms of the wrestling department, and they weren't able to do it, but Sterling moving up a weight class is just automatically going to get takedowns and out grapple Calvin Cater here. I just, he's going to have to prove it to me. That's what it comes down to. Maybe I'm a Cater fanboy and that's playing into it, but I just, I have to favor the guy who I think is the better striker, and I think he'll be able to keep the fight where he needs it, at least enough to win these rounds. So I'm going to side with the underdog here. We're going Cater by decision. That's the official pick. Which brings us to our next match up in the light heavyweight division as Alexander Rakic is a minus 120 favorite here. The comeback on Yuri Prohaska is plus 100. And we'll start on the Rakic side. This is a fight that I think actually sets up very well for Alexander Rakic. And I'll likely have a pretty sizable wager on him this weekend because I just think he's going to be the one with more ways to win this fight. I think for starters, what Rakic does very well, what's probably his best attribute 
is those powerful leg kicks, not just the calf kicks, the body kicks as well. He's very active with his legs. And we know that Prohaska has serious issues with calf kicks. We saw it as recent as his last fight against Alex Pereira, where he ended up getting knocked out and lost that fight, but his leg was compromised within minutes in that fight. And that's something that we've seen across his career. He doesn't really check leg kicks. I think Rakic is going to be able to have big success with that. I also think on the feet, while Rakic isn't as active and Rakic might not be as good of a boxer, I think he still swings with power. And we know that Prohaska has no striking defense. This dude is all gas, no breaks, fights with his hands down and gets stung in almost every single one of his fights. Even the fights that he's winning, he's getting hurt. The Dominic Reyes fight, he was basically out and then woke up as he fell on top of him. Like there were multiple fights where he's getting hurt and somehow pushing through it and winning like More times than not, you're going to end up getting knocked out. And that happened in his last fight against Pereira, but it was definitely an early stoppage. But that speaks to, you know, you can stun this guy. And in those moments where he's stunned, you can go for the finish. I think Rakic has just as much finishing upside in terms of the striking. And then I think if Rakic does get hurt on the feet, he can lean on that wrestling. He's very good at consolidating top position. He's not a dangerous grappler whatsoever, but he can control guys on the mat. We saw it in the Anthony Smith fight for basically the entire fight. We saw it in round two of the Jan Balkovich fight. And I know people are are talking smack about Rakic this week because he's a boring fighter. Obviously, he's way more boring than a guy like Yuri Prohaska, but I think that's more because he's a high fight IQ fighter. Like a lot of these fights, he's not taking risks. He's fighting the smart game plan. He's optimizing his win condition. And I think that can happen here against Yuri Prohaska, who is way less durable on the feet, who has no striking defense, who can be taken down and controlled as well. Like I just think Rakic has multiple ways to win here. The main concern, is he's coming off an ACL injury as well in that Jan Blakovich fight. So it's been a sizable layoff for him, but I think we're still getting some value on the Rakic side. I like Rakic here. Rakic by TKO. That's the official pick. And do me a quick favor, guys. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Takes two seconds to show your support and it goes a long way. I definitely appreciate it. Now, next fight up, we have Bo Nickel taking on Cody Brundage. He is the biggest betting favorite on the card at minus 2,100 currently. And obviously he's the most expensive fighter on DraftKings, but he's going to come with ownership because Bo Nickel has finished every opponent that he's fought, not just in the first round, but within the first couple minutes of the first round as well. This is a guy that comes from one of the best wrestling backgrounds we've ever seen, the former All-American Penn State wrestler, But he's also developed his hands to a degree as well. We saw that in his last fight against Val Woodburn where he stung him immediately. So now he's just creating other things that you have to be concerned about. It's not just the wrestling, not just the grappling, but now the striking starting to come along as well. And he's facing somebody in Cody Brundage who's got a lot of quit in him. I mean, let's be honest. Brundage... There's been times where Brundage has surprised us in terms of, you know, winning fights. And when he does win, it's typically an early finish in his own right. But we've also seen him just not show up, him quit mentally. The the Cedric Dumas fight comes to mind. Like, I just think Brundage is going to get taken down here and he's going to get finished relatively quickly. I think Brundage is notorious for jumping guillotine here. So any opportunity that he gets to do that, even against Bo Nickel, I think he's dumb enough to try it. And then we're just going to have Nickel in dominant position, eventually chasing a finish himself and getting it. So I'm going to say Nickel by submission. That's the official pick. And he's an obvious target on DraftKings. Next fight up, we have Armin Saruki in a minus 225 favorite. The comeback on Charles Oliveira is plus 185. And this is yet another banger matchup where I think you want exposure to both sides on DraftKings because I think regardless of who wins, they're going to end up scoring pretty well here. The over-under is lined at one and a half with slight juice on the over. And I think that's about right here. I favor the Sarukian side as the more durable prospect. I think that's the clear thing here. But this dude's an athletic freak. Like his his speed, his athleticism, his power in the grappling exchanges. I think that's going to be the difference here because we've seen Sarukian be able to consolidate position on the mat, even against good grapplers. And we've seen his finishing ability as well. As recent as his last last fight against Benil Dariush, my boy Benny, you know, going to sleep there. It was unfortunate, but it speaks to Sarukian's explosiveness. And I think against Charles Oliveira, who we've seen hurt multiple times, we know his durability is not great. 
but he's also been able to fight through it at times and find a finish of his own. This dude has the most finishes in UFC history, so he's never out of the fight, even against a guy as good as Sarukian. But I'm going to side with Sarukian here. I think it's more of grappling, where we see Sarukian just grinding clock, consolidating position. But I think he still scores pretty well in that scenario. So we're going Sarukian. I'm kind of in between TKO and decision, but I'll slightly favor the TKO here. I think Sarukian gets his hand raised. And next fight up, we have the BMF title on the line as Justin Gaethje takes on Max Holloway, moving up to 155 for this fight. And this is the first of three five rounders. Yes, three five rounders. So keep that in mind for DraftKings this week. It's not just the two title fights. The BMF title as well is going to be a five rounder. So it definitely throws a wrench into some things on DraftKings. Ownership's going to be very interesting this week. So be sure to check out fightnumbers.com where I'll have my ownership posted either tonight or tomorrow. And this is one where we we know Gaethje is going to have multiple advantages here. He's he's on a two-fight win streak here. Big knockout over Dustin Poirier in his last fight. I think the biggest advantage for Gaethje and why I am actually going to side with Gaethje in this matchup is going to be the leg kicks, man. Gaethje's leg kicks are, I think, the best on the UFC roster, potentially. Like, it's, it's always kind of been him and Barbosa in this division being known for their leg kicks. And I think against Max Holloway, that's going to be a big deal because we know Holloway doesn't really check leg kicks. And yes, he's been able to power through them a lot of times in multiple matchup. Obviously, the Volkanovski fight multiple times when he fought Volkanovski, the, legs, the leg kicks did play a factor. But Holloway's super tough, so I don't expect it to be like he's finishing Holloway for leg kicks, but I do think it could, you know, play a role in this fight because Gaethje's leg kicks are very, very powerful. And I think over the course of potentially five rounds, it is going to play a factor. And we know Gaethje, it's not just the leg kicks. He's very powerful with the hands as well. And while Holloway has the volume, the durability, the cardio... I think the power of Gaethje here, uh, along with the leg kicks as well, I think those two things combined is going to be why he's going to win a competitive but clear decision here. We're going Gaethje by decision. That's the official pick. Next fight up, we have Zhang Wiley, a minus 500 favorite now. The comeback on Yan Xiao Nan is plus 380. And it's no secret here. I like the Wiley side. I just think she's super tough to beat for anybody in this division. I think she's super well-rounded. It's not just the, the high pace, the power on the feet, but it's the ground game as well. And we've seen her rely on that more over the last few fights when she needs to. That last fight against Amanda Lemos, I mean, it, was, it wasn't competitive for even a single second. And I think the biggest thing here in this fight is Yan Xiao Nan, while she can be competitive on the feet and maybe even have her moments early, I think the takedowns are going to be there for Wiley. And we know Yan Xiao Nan can't really defend them, but also doesn't work back to her feet many times when she's taken down. Basically, all the fights where she gets taken down, she usually ends up losing because she doesn't know how to work back to her feet. And against Wiley, who's very physically strong, who's going to be able to consolidate that position, I just think the takedowns are going to be the biggest difference here. I'm going to side with Wiley. She's a big favorite, but I think it makes sense. And in terms of DraftKings, I think she's got the best combination of floor and ceiling on this entire slate in terms of like her safety. Like all, all these other fighters have great ceilings as well. But I think like if you if you have to tell me I, I can only have one fighter that I'm the most confident wins and also scores well on DraftKings, I think like outside of Bo Nickel, it's probably Zhang Wai Li here. And she might even have a bigger ceiling because of the potential for five rounds if she's racking up those takedowns. So we're gonna go Wai Li by decision. That's the official pick. Which brings us to our main event where we have Alex Pereira, a minus 130 favorite. The comeback on Jamal Hill is plus 110. And I went back and forth on this fight because on one hand, like the the logical side of my brain is like Alex Pereira is clearly a better striker to me. This dude comes from a high level kickboxing background. We know he's got the super powerful hooks. He's capable of knocking anybody out with those. And he's got some sharp leg kicks as well. But I also worry about the durability, man. Like, he's been knocked out. He's been hurt multiple times. Even in the fights that he he's won, he's been hurt at times as well. And on the flip side, Jamal Hill, I have concerns with him as well. Like, yes, he's got the volume. He's got the power. Those things are great. But he's coming off a torn Achilles, which is one of the worst injuries you can have. And it wasn't even that long ago. I think it was July when that happened. So it's not like the, the longest turnaround here. And I also think 
like, and this is more narrative, but like the dude has looked legitimately fat and tubby in a lot of the videos and clips and pictures since that injury. And like, maybe it doesn't affect anything, but it's not nothing either. And also like, where's his head at? Because like the dude's constantly making these TikTok videos, you know, he's doing all this stuff like outside of just actually training and focusing on recapturing the belt. Like those things are a concern for me. So it's one where I think it's close. I think either guy can win by knockout. Despite my concerns with the Hill side, I think this is the type of fight where a lot of those things just don't really matter because at the end of the day, somebody's going to get knocked out early in this fight. And I just trust Hill's durability more. And that's really what it comes down to for me. Even though I think Pereira's a better striker, I think Pereira isn't coming off a serious injury and is more focused. I just don't trust the chin. The dude's been rocked multiple times. He's been in wars. And I think these guys are going to trade and eventually that's going to be the difference here. So I'm going to side with the underdog here in Jamal Hill. We're going Hill by TKO. That's the official pick. And as always, guys, fightnumbers.com will have my DraftKings player rankings, ownership projections as well. We got a bunch of cool betting tools and resources. The picks are up behind the paywall as well. Be sure to check it out. It's everything you need at fightnumbers.com. And lastly, we are going to do the betting show. The Fight Numbers betting show is going to be free this week for UFC 300. So be on the lookout on Twitter at John Kelly DFS. I'll post a link. We're going to go live at 7.30 on Wednesday, and it's going to be up on the new Fight Numbers YouTube channel. So it's completely free. If you want to check that out, that's our show that's usually behind the paywall with me, Evan, Ozzy, and Pepe. That's going to be it, guys. Best of luck, and we'll see you next time.